the choir. But how do you sell an IPM service to a client? How do you convince them that there's value and that they really might need help doing it and doing it well? So that's what I want to talk about. Our topic, integrated pest management is designed to give the best economic re uh, outcome for pest control. This talk will cover the, the choices one can make to measure the costs and benefits in commercial horticulture. Now, commercial horticulture can mean a lot of different things to us. Um, in the previous talk, I was in here and Gordon was doing um, enterprise budgets uh, and partial budgets on vegetable crops. Um, coming from Central Maryland, we have everything from fruit and vegetables, we have sod, we have landscape. Um, we've got a, a nursery, greenhouse, a lot of horticulturally related crops. And it takes a little bit of a special expertise in each one of these to go into that task, into that area, and do the job and do it well. Um, I guess it's been two years ago, uh, Central Maryland lost our um, big IPM scout for vegetables. Bill Morose passed away rather suddenly. Uh, and there's a hole right now. There's a huge hole in this area. Now, we've got people that can handle nursery. We've got people that handles greenhouse. But we don't have anybody that has the expertise to slide over. And the farm community is clamoring for it. So by definition, integrated pest management is a sustainable approach to managing pests by combining biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools in a way that minimizes economic, health, and environmental risk. Coming to us from USDA ARS. So as we look at IPM and we look at the many things we're going to try to talk to our producers about, or maybe you're a producer and you're trying to convince yourself that, OK, I'm already doing this. Do I need to do more? It's a multifaceted stone that we're looking at. And you know, we, we think about the times of year and when we're out. So as an IPM scout, frost happened over the weekend. Freeze, actually, for most of us. So do we have any concerns at this point in time? Do I need to go back to the farm? Is there anything I need to pay attention to on the farm? Um, you know, we, we think about that because you know, we, we are monitoring all year round. And where did we not get weed control last year? Might be a good time to go see things like this. So we look at this and um, we spend a lot of time out in fields, actually, you know, taking that walk, touching, taking tissue samples, uh, IDing different insects. But there's a lot of other tools that we can, you know, pull in that I hope to um, help you make sure that we, we recognize. So, you know, we, we are looking at the whole idea of forecasting. Forecasting is huge, especially as we look at disease management. As we look at disease management, as the individual farmer, how do they know when that potential, let's say, you know, uh, powdery mildew is going to come in? We, we have many good methods, and Kate Everett spends a lot of time emailing us things, but is that particular farmer on the email chain? Do they have time right now, amidst everything else they're doing, to check those emails? So the forecasting, pest trapping, monitoring, you know, physically doing that, understanding thresholds, these are all part. Cultural controls, biological controls, Yes, and we do talk about chemical controls because that is part of the big picture. Record keeping, remember, as a IPM scout, you're making recommendations. Can the pesticide division at MDA come visit you? Do they need to do inspections with you? Yes, because you're making recommendations. So as an IPM consultant, you have to have a license so they're going to verify that you're making sound recommendations. Then we, we look at you know, soil prep. So far, Montgomery County supposedly doesn't have Palmer amaranth, supposedly. And one of, the, one of the ways we're dealing with Palmer amaranth is we're doing some soil work. So that might be one of the alternatives that might be recommended to someone. So, and then the whole idea of planting and how to plant and when to plant and um, how to avoid some issues that come along with that. So a lot of words, 
Potential benefits of integrated pest management. Reduction in high-risk pesticides. How many times in the past two days have we heard about the pyrethroids and the potential that they can take out our beneficial insects? We've heard a lot about that. Very, very important that we let that sink in because we don't want to lose our beneficials. And the increased use of reduced risk pesticides. I've been doing some research in the past couple of years with Stanton Gill. Stanton's a, a state specialist with the University of Maryland, and we've been doing some work in looking at Japanese beetle control in nurseries. And okay, we can go to the standard products and we can get a good kill. But we've been working with a new form of BT that has been very, very effective. And it, one of the things it's doing is it gives the insect the ability to still survive for a longer period until it starves to death because it just no longer has a desire to eat. And it, and it also has no desire to mate. So we still see the Japanese beetle on the nursery trees, but we don't see any damage. And right next to that tree that we have treated, the tree is de totally defoliated. So we know the pressure's there. We know that there's nothing else wrong. It's what's on that tree. They've taken one simple bite and they stopped. So we look at some of these new reduced risk pesticides that we can use. And then we also consider cultural controls. Very, very important to us. Can good IPM increase yields? Can good IPM help us in vegetable production? Can it help us in nursery production? Can it help us have a marketable crop coming out of a greenhouse? Yes, good IPM because the grower is then able to be ahead of the problem and not always reacting to the problem once it occurs. We want to make sure that we are providing as part of our work, you know, good soil analysis so they can use appropriate amounts of fertilizers. So we can go in and with our uh, soluble salt meters, we can look at, you know, what's the load in the pot. We help them, guide them through the process of field fertilizer use, especially as they look at, you know, what's going on from their nutrient management plan. Maryland especially, we have this, and this basically is their prescription for nutrient use in the field. So prevents crop loss through proper scouting, but how do you sell someone on this idea? How do you convince them? I've had greenhouse growers that tell me time and time again, oh, we got it. We've got it. I've had a sod producer. Yeah, it's okay. We know what we're looking for. Small vegetable producers. I'm okay. I know what I'm doing. I know what to look for. I guess, I guess my favorite is my Christmas tree grower that, Chuck, I don't need to get another scout. I've got two boys. We've got it all covered. And mowing doesn't get done. They're too busy trying to get trees in the ground or they're too busy dealing with the strawberry crop because that's a huge payer right now. So by the time that things slow down, the insects, the mites, the disease, the weeds have taken over the Christmas tree area because nobody's been over there to even walk through them in maybe two months. Whereas if they'd had a paid scout, hey, don't forget, uh, weed control in the Christmas trees is gonna keep mites down, things like that. So we, we have to be able to show there's a, an effective return for their investment. So we're gonna see slower development of resistance to pesticides. We are seeing resistance in so many different ways. Um, it was interesting to see, and, and I am not an entomologist, it is interesting to see that we are starting to see resistance to pyrethroids. So the, the toolbox that we've used for years and it's always been good is now becoming much less effective in that area. Now I'm well aware of the resistance issue in herbicides, well aware of the resistance issue in fungicides, but now we see this now really rearing its head in ways that, okay, what's next? What do I do now? I've been doing this for years and now it's failing me. But bottom line, we want to maintain a balanced ecosystem. Uh, our, the public in general, as they look at anything we produce, they're looking for it to be as natural as possible. Can you imagine a nursery producing landscape trees and having a market for it organically? 
What do you think? Is someone going to care what the landscape tree has had done to it in the past five years? Only if it's cost competitive. Welcome to Central Maryland. That is not going to be a concern. They want it organic. And they want to know from the time you plant it till the time you harvest it that no products have hit that tree. So we, we, we have another realm that's opening up to us. The public can, can really drive business. And we have a nursery grower that we do quite a bit of research on in Central Maryland that the only reason he's gone organic is because the market's driven it and he can sell the trees. And he's a new nursery grower. He's recently retired and he, what's it, fifth year yes. for Steve? Five years in nursery production. And he found this niche and everybody else said, forget it, nobody will buy them. They're buying them. He's selling out of his organic trees every year. And so there, there's niches that we need to think about. Do you feel that that is a fear-driven niche though? Well, in some ways it is a fear-driven niche because, I mean, you look at so many of the social media sites at how they really point to pesticides being all bad. Uh, you know, we have a lot of drive that's telling people that this is bad, that's bad, and, and use this as a replacement for glyphosate and uh, all these types of things. We, we, that, there's a lot of, of um, fear. So yes, there, there's some fear there, but in a, in a nursery tree, which you're not gonna eat, you're really not gonna walk across uh, you know, with bare feet, things like that, I mean, people are still desiring it, still desiring it. We're, we're driving and, you know, in our communities are driving this. Um, my office is in Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, Montgomery County recently passed a cosmetic pesticide bill, which banned the use of turf herbicides, unless it's organic. So, now, it has been taken to court. Um, by the way, the council approved it overwhelmingly. County executive refused to sign it because he wanted nothing to do with it. It went to court and it was struck down. But they are appealing it. So where it will go, we don't know. The county still believes that they, they have a good standing and that they, they should do this. So you know, there's, there's this whole idea, you know, what else can we do as we try to do weed control, pest control, et cetera. We want to be able to guide our, our customers. Uh, slower development of resistant pests, uh, resistance to pesticides in general. Um, we know that there, there is development uh, for resistance potential there. We want, to, we want to know what we can do to prevent more resistance. We don't want to create a super pest. Gosh, they already exist in the medical industry, don't they? There's a lot of super pests that we have. Uh, in some ways, you might call Palmer amaranth the next super pest because it's so resistant and, and difficult for us to control. And some of the products that we want to shift to have concerns. I mean, the dicamba, the whole dicamba industry um, problem. And you know, the fact that you know, Arkansas is potentially going to ban the use of dicamba in soybeans next year. So as we look at this, IPM reduces the risk of this occurring through our work as some of the methods adopted by IPM are basically natural and they, they give us the ability to think. But now, is natural necessarily where your client wants to go? Is it going to give them a dollar return? That's going to be important. We're trying to do this whole idea of maintaining a balanced ecosystem. Somebody walks up to the, the uh, sweet corn producer and says, is this organic? And I have one and producer in my county and um, he doesn't have the best temper in the world and he'll explain to them no uh, I use IPM and it's sustainable and in a lot of ways that answered their they, they got the answer they thought they want but if you were to sell them an ear that had a worm in it do you think that uh, ear of corn would come back yes in fact in one case he sold uh, a couple of dozen ears of corn the next day they brought it back and by the way, he had sold them bicolored corn and they brought back all yellow corn and wanted a refund. Uh, so, I mean, customer's not gonna be happy. We, we've gotta help them get there.
The use of pesticides may eradicate the pest population. We know we can take care of most pests. Most pests, most definitely. But unfortunately, sometimes we're wiping out the non-target. And uh, I have seen people bring me tomato plants on a, at least every year. I get a tomato plant in that is almost completely uh, stripped of all of its green material. You know, the tomato hornworm routine. And two or three years ago, somebody brought me that to said tomato plant in, and it had a ladybug beetle larva on it. How do I kill that? I said, that's not what did this. Oh, yes it is, it's the only thing around. Could not convince them that there was anything else. They wanted to know how to control that. Thank goodness it was just a homeowner. But homeowners need guidance too. IPM can eradicate pests through the selection of the best prevention and control methods, and hopefully we're gonna do this up front, ahead of the game, while maintaining that balance of the ecosystem. We look at you know pesticide resistance in all areas that we deal with. You know, using the same product time after time is what has led us to this. And we have to be prepared to make sure that we don't get ourselves into a situation where, you know, we've got, you know, the mayor's tail really doing well. And if you saw Mark Van Gessel's talk this morning, one of the things you learned was never wait until it's that big to start the spray. With a Palmer Amaranth, catch it as small as possible. These are the types of things that you, the IPM consultant, bring to the table so that people understand timeliness is so important. But the bottom line is cost versus value. Is it going to pay? How do I convince them it's going to pay? Can I show reduced pesticide usage? I can't tell you that at the beginning of the year. But maybe we can look back in the past and we can talk about the old cover sprays that we used to do. We did them on a calendar basis. Remember that? We did them every seven to 10 days, no matter what. And we just kept on doing it. We didn't see any pests because, oh, we took care of them. But did we need some of those? The reduced use of pesticides is more cost effective in the long term as IPM controls pests when they are surging. But how do you know when they're surging? If you know sweet corn's up and it's growing well, is the farmer going to take time from the tomatoes or the squash or the watermelon or the whatever to go through and scout for problems? Does he have time? Pesticides cost money. The value of our time to apply the pesticides costs money. So anytime I can cut that down, I'm doing a good idea. Now, the idea of having fresh eyes someone different look how many times have you lost something and you've gone to find it and you couldn't see it you can't see the forest for the trees type of thing but yet somebody else comes in there it is and you know we, we are seeing more and more of this whether it be done through drones or it would be done through just you walking the fields um, in all aspects of agriculture is very, very important to us. So when there are advantages, there's potential disadvantages, and we have to understand that. You know, when we start to think about what's the average age of our farmer? So we're getting up there in age. How in tune with modern methods are we? Who was the last person that tried to sell us something and they had the solution? You know, some, you know, I'll be the first one to admit, I'm 62. I'll be 62 on Sunday. Um, and, you know, thank you. Uh, a couple years ago, my office was hacked from the aspect that somebody downloaded a movie. And they didn't pay the um, royalty fees, so we had our internet shut off. Imagine an extension office with no internet. So the IT person comes in and she says, okay, we need to see your computer. What are you looking for? I'm looking for BitTorrent, a way of downloading movies. I said, what's that? She, she says, well, you know, downloading music, downloading movies. I said, I can't even download music. So it's one of those things. Sometimes we need a newer set of eyes or someone that is going to trainings and staying current and talking to other people. You know, there's whoever is making the decisions, more involvement in the technicalities of different methods. 
getting away from pyrethroids as an example. What are my alternatives? What'd you do, break it? He spilled it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Realizing that taking this time is time and energy consuming. I mean, it takes away from other tasks that are done on the farm. And we have to be prepared to plan ahead, not react when the problem shows up at our door. Think of powdery mildew. When powdery mildew is already attacked, is that the time to be controlling it? No, we need to be ahead of the game as much as possible. More involvement in the technicalities of the alternative methods. This is where you, the independent scout, can come in. Individual producers and all those involved in IPM have to be educated about their options. Who's going to take that 60-year-old producer and convince him that there's a better way? You know, my pyrethroids, my fungicide program, my spray program has worked for years. My tillage methods are perfect. Remember when Extension used to say bank phosphorus? We don't anymore. Do you have a person on your staff, your farm, that's going to be dedicated? That's their job, and it's their most important job. We have a fruit and vegetable producer in Montgomery County, um, two brothers and a sister. And each person had an assigned crop that they were responsible for. And I can remember one year when there was a particular tax issue that came down right about the time that blueberries were starting to bloom. And the person that was responsible for scouting blueberries was also the accountant for the farm business. So they spent two weeks getting all the accounting up to date, and they were two weeks late getting out to even walk into the blueberry field, and they'd already had damage occur. Do you have someone that's going to dedicate that time? And it's their most important job. Nothing can pull them away. That's one of the things we have to tell people. Proper identification of what is found. You, the farmer, where are you going to send it? OK, that's where you know, people like Andy, Jenny, you know, and other extension educators, Peter, um, you know, we all come into play and we, we help do these IDs. But, you know, well, the extension agent is where? How many extension agents are in Carroll County right now, Peter? Zero. Zero. Any ag extension agents. And, you know, you know, most of Maryland is here. So if there's a pest problem right now, oh, gosh, what, what are their options? So, you know, if you've got an independent scout that is knowledgeable, they're going to be able to do that, or they know the next person they can go to in the list. When the Peters or the Jennies or the Andrews, uh, when we're not available, they know who to go to. So, IPM does take time, has to be scheduled, has to be dedicated time. Uh, it has to be out of the vehicle walking. Uh, the brain needs to be focused on that, not on other things. Uh, we need to do this to make sure that we're looking at the different methods that we can integrate into this to give, give us the most effective pest control methods. Uh, not everything responds the same way, so we have to make sure that we don't look at one particular pest control that's going to cause another pest to bloom. And we think about, you know, mite blooms when we use certain insecticides. Products over time, they no longer do their job. What is the next best thing? Where do I find out about it? How do I get the appropriate training so that I'm going to be prepared to use that product? Think of, think of the Liberty Link situation where farmers are going to have to be trained to utilize that product. So we look at dollar savings. This is a driver to tell people they can save money. Reduce use of pesticides versus just regular calendar springs. We look at Determine what your action threshold is. I do quite a bit of work in ornamentals, and uh, I work with several very large nurseries. Any damage is enough to cause treatment because their customer is going to walk into that nursery and they're going to walk away when they start to see damage on trees. So while you think, okay, I've got some young trees and uh, Japanese beetle aren't going to do that much damage. I can let them go. 
but it might slow them down enough that they're not marketable as soon as you could have had them marketed. Or the customer sees these trees and, wow, these trees look horrible. Well, those aren't the trees I'm trying to sell you. They're over here. No, okay, well, I, I've got to go some other place right now. There, there's the connotation that maybe you're not a good manager there. So we want to look at what is the action threshold that you establish as part of your IPM program? You know, is it based upon aesthetics? That's going to be your action threshold. Or is it going to be an economic injury threshold that it pays to apply now because the harvest is going to be smaller? We, we look at these types of things. Cabbage production, decreased in insecticide applications, averaging six per season, amounting to a 43% reduction in pesticide costs. Now, this goes back to 1989. Do we still see these types of things that we could offer someone? Think about that. Now, we've already mentioned this, the consumer attitude. There is a section of the consumer population that is looking for as sustainable as possible. Now, they don't necessarily need to be organic, but they want to know that it's done well. So when we can have the farmer say, I'm using IPM, I'm using sustainable practices, I'm using as low a risk product as I can to still maintain the quality that you want. That's going to be very, very important to them. The consumer may be willing to pay more for reduced pesticide use products. In some sections of the, the uh, farm market population, there, that's a driving force. No mention of one's product safety over another uh, product in IPM labeling, but makes the customer aware that I'm doing things as a producer to decrease the product use. It's just not going to be the ways it was in the 50s and 60s and the 70s. Quick story. I was a pesticide applicator for the University of Maryland, actually for the College Park campus. And I did this in the 70s. We had a spray routine in which every plant, tree, shrub, etc., got sprayed on a very regular basis. The, the horticultural managers said, this is the way we do it. We just spray. We keep everything with cover sprays on it. We will have no problems then. In comes Mike Raup, Dr. Raup, Dr. Bug. And he comes to the University of Maryland campus as a young professor and starts to walk the campus and he can't find any beneficial insects. Well, we've done a good job. But that was, that was really the beginning of the IPM movement on campus because he came to campus grounds and said, hey, can we try something different? And that's when they went and they started to do scouting. So time was not spent all day long spraying. Time was spent with people going out and looking and seeing, and we educated certain crew leaders on what to look for. They reported back, and then we reacted to where the problems were. We spent a lot less time on spraying. We spent a lot less time or money on product, and the beneficial insects started to bloom. So, win-win. We look at the environmental benefits of IPM, the potential reduction in use of certain pesticides or pesticides in general. We establish that action threshold. We determine what it is. We start to look at what is the lowest effective rate you start to think about how rates have changed over years and how EPA is constantly reviewing products. Has the farmer kept up with the changes and the fact that he can still get control? I can't tell you how many times a farmer will tell me, well, I've been using so many ounces per gallon for years. Well, it's changed. They, they have a responsibility to know that, by the way. Allows uh, for control by natural enemies of pests. Sometimes we get in settings where, you know, a pesticide is not necessarily the best option. And we have to think about that. Reduce the chances of pesticides developing resistance, uh, potential energy savings. I'm not driving the tractor as much. So I'm not out there, you know, expending, you know, fuel, et cetera. And the reduced pesticide applications 
could avoid problems with soil compaction, just trips over the field, uh, from the application equipment. So what are the benefits of increased knowledge of pest management options? Well, you know, gosh, knowledge changes constantly and uh, there's a lot of things happening. It allows growers to determine the seriousness of a problem and to take action when they have determined their action threshold. You, the scout, can tell them, hey, we've got this. And there's very good models that we can throw numbers into that can say, okay, it's time to spray. We, we, we have those available to us. We understand, um, we get a better understanding of pests and their ways of control and their timing. And you know, as we go through um, climate change, timing is changing and we have to recognize that. And is the farmer recognizing that things are occurring at different times than they used to? You know, we talk about European corn borer and we're seeing them earlier in the season and corn earworm appearing at different times of the season. And we're seeing weeds germinate earlier and earlier every year. I, I do soil temperatures on a regular basis in the turf industry. And I started doing it to help them understand when they could start to apply pre-emergent herbicides for crabgrass to get the most, um, the greatest amount of efficacy out of those products. Uh, now it's turned into I'm doing them in the fall so they know when to plant tulips. Because if you plant your tulips too early and the soil's too warm, then fungal diseases can take them out. Allows the grower to modify their pest management programs to meet their specific needs. And then hopefully we're going to see a decreased number of uh, applications of products. Now, uh, Dr. Jerry Brust is a, um, a vegetable specialist with the University of Maryland and several years ago he and Teresa McCoy actually did a survey of our population that are raising vegetables and what we, we started to ask a couple key questions. Estimate on average how many high-risk pesticide applications you have been able to decrease per season because of the information you've gained from the vegetable IPM program. Zero decrease, only 1.2% of the respondents. Seven to nine, 6.8%. Four to six uh, decreased sprays. A quarter of the people that were using the IPM program. Now, they had to be paying attention to what Jerry was publishing on a regular basis. And he puts out information for them. But they had to be aware, they had to be making use of them. Reduct, uh, reduced my high-risk pesticide applications. About 50% of them said yes. About 20% said no. And about 20% said not sure. So we, we do see that through a good IPM program, the farmer is benefiting, the producer is benefiting. This was vegetable specific. And this was Maryland vegetable specific. As we think about some key points to use, um, there are no silver bullets. Treat causes, not symptoms. Pest presence does not mean pest problems. Just in time versus just in case. And I love the last one. If you kill the natural enemies, you inherit the problems and the work. So as we look at the no silver bullets, don't oversell IPM. It's another technology, another tool that we can use. You know, treat causes, not symptoms. And you know, you see this, but this is actually what's doing the, uh, the problem. It's what's consuming. And I've even had people that saw this and still wanted to spray. Just to be safe, just to make sure. Did they need to spray? No. I always get excited when I see that and it's like, wow, this is really neat, it's working. Uh, also from uh, some, some information that Jerry did, know your particular action threshold. When is it you know you need to be doing something? So you need to know the cost of the products, you need to know the value of the crop, and then we start to do counts 
We literally need to be doing counts. How many insects do I find? What is going to be the potential for my loss? And that when is the trigger point? When do I pull the trigger and say, okay, enough's enough, I have to pull it. Is it an economic loss? Is it an aesthetic loss? We need to know what that's going to be. That's something that has to be discussed up front. Here's a very good um, uh, threshold calculator. Came uh, from NC State University, uh, corn earworm. So this is looking at sweet corn. So we're looking at, in particular at sweet corn. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, in this case, uh, no, this is on soybeans, I believe. Yeah, this is soybeans. 14 inch rows. Uh, you know, we're looking at value at $11 per bushel. And it's going to tell us when it's time to go ahead and throw the trigger. Just in time versus just in case. Questions to ask. Is the pest population or incidence rate increasing? Were natural predators actually seen? Will waiting push pest populations or incidence rate above the economic uh, injury threshold? And what's your history shown? What is your history shown? Now, history may not be the determining factor here, but what has it shown in the past? We have trapping ability, uh, and this information is actually relayed to USDA regularly. So we do have the ability to capture what different locations are seeing. Remember that if you kill the natural enemies, you are going to inherit the work. So careful decision making can help us determine whether the injuries are going to increase or not, or whether I'm going to potentially take out the beneficials that are helping me. Uh, when considering products to use, always look for very, very targeted solutions, not broad spectrum solutions. Uh, especially when we're, we have some ability to really target certain insecticides that will be like stylet pluggers so that they can no longer suck a material out. When broad spectrum products are used, they damage the balance and create bigger issues. Remember, the IPM is a philosophy and we're, it's basically we're looking at uh, how can I manage this these IPM components and principles together change the way we view pest control from short-term control to long-term management strategies involving multiple approaches. It costs money in one way, but it's potentially going to save money in others. So when I start to look at IPM and its fullest approach, I, I look at, you know, good appropriate soil preparation. In some cases, we are still doing tillage. Selection of the best possible varieties to avoid certain diseases, or in some cases, bring in some of the stack technologies. Uh, proper use of irrigation to prevent plant stresses. And not everywhere has irrigation ability. The use of plant materials in buffers that will attract pollinators and beneficial insects. And then appropriate use of nutrients, crop uh, monitoring and, and as part of pest management. And we look at this one particular nursery in which they're literally planting a, a, a pollinator attract and a beneficial insect attracted to bring in insects into the nursery. Purposefully doing this costs money, but they found their overall pesticide bill went down. They look at when do I need to react? And you know, we start to look at disease hitting. Well, we have, in this case, uh, something that comes out of the, the tri-state area, the, the male cast for, for cantaloupes. And you can get on this list, but does the farmer have the time? I mean, do you still have farmers that don't use the internet? We still have farmer, we have sections of our counties that don't have good internet ability. Big question is, to hire or not to hire an IPM scout? If it's done internally, is it a, a top priority? Do you often get busy, so busy that you don't finish all your work? This is a question to ask the farmer. When done by an independent contractor, it is their only job they're doing for you, and they should be providing you a well-written report that's going to tell you what you should be looking for and your potential ways of controlling. Outside contractors are attending things like this, crop school, where they're learning the latest technologies, the latest methods, the latest products, and they're going to share them with you. 
And they're also going to be going other places where they might see things or they might be reading about a certain pest coming up the coast or it's already on the eastern shore and they're going to help prevent that. This is um, one of my friends, that sh this is Marie Rojas. Uh, she's an independent IPM scout. She does nurseries in Maryland. Uh, and she is at uh, Ray Melton Farm in, uh, in Frederick County. And this is, you know, she's out there inspecting and she provides a multi-page report to Steve on a very regular basis. Steve Black, the owner of Ray Melton Farm wrote this. We intensely scout our crops for pests and disease. Our rigorous monitoring program allows us to detect and track pests and evaluate our control efforts. In addition, using two contracted visiting professional scouts gives us continuing fresh eyes on the crop, nursery trees and shrubs. Sure, we could do it ourselves, but our scouts monitor at many other local nurseries and are able to bring information found at other locations to us. So Steve Black is sold on this process. You know, University of Maryland publishes on a every Friday basis a landscape IPM report. This is the Virginia Tech one for vegetables. They, by the way, they also do it for nursery and landscape. Um, Dave Myers has one for vegetable crops in Maryland. There's a lot of different sources of information you have out there. The problem is, do all the individual farmers have the time to seek it out where you could be providing that for them? So we need to bottom line show the value of IPM, have planned actions, know what you're going to do, know your pest issues before they arrive, really be able to discuss them in the spring. Look at uh, all options the producer wants to use. Discuss what they want. Explain the pros and cons to they, their ideas. Explain the value and then let it sell itself because ultimately they've got to want it because if they don't want it, they're not going to see the value. Once you can show them the value, then they're going to be happy and that's truly the bottom line. Questions? Have you seen the um, IPM program using up a Q-Pack in Jersey? I have not. You should check that out because they, uh, uh, they used to do, they got like 10 acres under cover. And what's it called? Q-Pack, K-U-B-E-P-A-K. K-U-B-E-P-A-K, -E -E I believe it is. Okay. And they, uh, so they, they, were, they had a full-time employee seven days a week spraying the entire facility and it was killing them on product and overtime. Yeah. And Copper came in and said, you should try one of your bays with our beneficial insect package. They went from doing that to now they do like 95% of their operation with beneficial and they have one guy spraying once a week. Occasionally, yeah. And they're using some kind of um, some kind of imaging and they can figure out where the hot spots are. So they're doing targeted sprays just where they see a hot spot, so they reduce their, their labor and spraying and they cut their chemical bill like I forget significantly. It's like 100 grand or something. Like you know, and as we see, um, you know, the unmanned aerial technology and as it comes down the pike and improves, that's going to be another tool that the farmer independently isn't going to be able to do, but the scout's going to bring with them. I remember seeing Randy Hayes show up in a field with a motorcycle on the back of his truck. So he could pop it off and he could buzz through the fields and check things out, uh, beat walking. He could cover more territory in a day, drives it back, puts it on the back of his truck and drives away. You know, all these technologies that you, the scout, potentially bring, that IPM brings, it has value. Thank you for that. Now I'm going to look that one up. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing, the numbers. How am I on time, Andy? You've got five minutes. Is there any other questions? How, how do you suggest Are you talking grapes? Uh, watermelon. Oh, okay. Vegetables. Pumpkins, hard squash, literally any mine crop. Okay, well, you know, when, when we're looking at that, number one, we're going to look at the tools that we have. You know, we have the Melcast, you know, we have the different, um, like the, the Maryland vegetable uh, alerts. Um, you know, we have the ones coming out of North Carolina, Virginia. 
we, we utilize all these as a method of what is coming to us. Where is the, is it an insect or is it an insect or disease that can potentially overwinter here or in, in those cases, okay, I'm going to start to look at degree days to implement. We're going to look at trapping systems for, you know, what insects can I trap that will then tell me, okay, I need to start a program because I've matched the threshold that is determined it's a problem. These are going to be some of the ways that we're going to, to utilize decreasing just cover sprays because we did it in the past. So we have, to, we have to use the tools that are out there. Yeah. Are you the producer or are you trying to, are you a scout trying to sell to a producer? Uh, I'm, I'm a consultant. Okay. So my like, issues, I'm in Pennsylvania and I work Lehigh, Berks, Lebanon, yes. Lancaster, lots of vegetable growers. And what I found especially this year, things that are seeing in diseases that were progressing in the field, Penn State was still denying that they were in the state. So like New Jersey was claiming that they would have downy mildew. Pennsylvania was claiming we don't have downy mildew, but we have it. And even if you'd send them pictures and whatnot. So I just found like even even coming off the eastern shoreboard, I would call the NC State stuff, the Virginia Tech stuff, and they'd say, look for this, look for this, look for this, and within three days we have it. But I just I just found like Pennsylvania lack. Well, and you see, um, I, I won't comment about Pennsylvania, but you know, here they're going to start giving you some uh, the environmental favorability factors, and the, and they're going to tell us how we actually can start to predict for ourselves based upon temperature, based upon days of cloudy condition, based upon rainfall or irrigation use, and then you're going to start tracking it yourself, and then you're going to be a, you're going to follow. Okay, uh, the Eastern Shore of Maryland had it. And, you know, we know the weather pattern, so so many days afterwards, I'm going to have it. Yeah, a lot of it depends on the weather, which way the wind is blowing. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. But, you know, if you've got groups that they're not recognizing it, then you're going to have to start doing the predictions on your own. Okay. Yeah, bi yes, big business opportunity. Tom. And that was in, when we, we had the, uh, the plot for the uh, test plants. The and sentinel the, crops. Sentinel, sentinel plants. So uh, that's where your expertise is going to come in, is if you're seeing the symptoms uh, and you can get it diagnosed, and of course always get it diagnosed, then uh, you, you, you're, you're providing value service to your, even though the other, where, where their sites are, they're not important, uh, you're ahead of the game for your growth. Okay, well, thank you for coming. Appreciate your time today.